today is Thursday, July 14th, 2011, and I am here with Roland Cull. And um, so when did your family first come to the island? The first set of my family came to Beaver Island in 1857. That was the year after King Strang was shot. They were in, in the area from Mackinac Island in this whole area. They arrived uh, here. They had left their two children in Ireland at that time with one of their sets of, of parents. The two grandchildren were left there. Uh, they settled in a Mormon house here on Beaver Island. And they, the grandfather in Ireland, sold his sheep at a raffle, or had a raffle for his sheep made enough money to send his two daughters, granddaughters, to America. One was eight, one was 11. And the one ended up, the eight-year-old ended up being my grandmother. My grandfather came from County Mayo in Ireland. And I forgot to say that that the O'Donnells came also from from Mayo at at that time. They uh, he was came across, and I believe he must have walked across at the Sioux because there's never been no record in Ellis Island that he ever that he entered the country. He was 16 years old. He was fishing in a place called Shoals Creek up in northern Michigan for a gentleman by the name of Pond. With, with, with Shishawa Point then? Yes. Okay. So, you can begin your story. <laughs> My grandfather came from Ireland uh, as a 16-year-old boy, and he was fishing for a gentleman in Shishawa Point, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's about 25 miles east of the town of Manistique, where Shishawa Point is located. He was living in the, in the uh, net shed of the gentleman by the name of Pond. There was three gentlemen up there. One of them wanted to possess Pond's wife, who was a beautiful lady at that time. They came, and there was a lot of lawless over there, partying and drinking, and not too much uh, law. And they came, they were fighting, they were on the beach. They came back, started tearing down the, the net shed, it ended up, they came back at 4.30 in the morning and started tearing down the net shed. They went in and choked my grandfather, whose name was Dennis Cull. They, and Pond came out of his house and he said, stop or I'll shoot, stop or I'll shoot. Bang, he shot. They found the gentleman the next morning Pond started to come to Beaver Island because the King Strang's judges were still doing court cases here. He did not want to go to Mackinac Island because the sheriff was related to the gentleman that he shot. They were overtaken seven miles outside of Shishwa Point by the sheriff and he was taken to Mackinac Island, tried, found guilty, sentenced to prison, but 10 years later the Michigan Supreme Court overturned this because he was protecting his servant and that's where 
the expression comes, a man's home is his castle, because he was protecting his servant, which was my grandfather, Dennis Cull. Dennis proceeded coming to Beaver Island then. He knew my great-grandparents from Mayo in, in Ireland, who had received their two daughters from their grandparents over there. One was eight and one was 11, and he told the O'Donnells, I will wait till she's 16 and we will get married. So when they were 16, they got married, and that was in 1874. The land that I own now has been in the family name since 1874. My one niece and nephew, sister-in-law, and myself have our homes located on it. My grandparents lived here. They had 11 children. My dad was was uh, the fifth child. He was born in 1885. What was his name? His name was was Michael Cull. The uh, he came from uh, the family. He was the only one that stayed on Beaver Island at that time. His dad died in 1897. My grandmother married another gentleman by the name of John Buffalo Malloy. He had 12 children, so it ended up that I had 22 niece, uh, aunts and and uncles. Oh my goodness. So I had a few. <laughs> really? I had a few. That's great. My parents, uh, on the other side, my grand grandfather came here uh, in the early 1880s. He ran a general store in what's called Sam Bay now. It's next to Central Michigan University where his store was. And what was his name? Sorry. His name was Hugh Cunahan. Okay. My grandmother had came from Ireland. She was born in 1854, and her, her name was uh, O'Donnell. She came to Beaver Island and she married a gentleman by the name of McDonald. They had three children and McDonald passed away by accident, I believe is the way the story goes. She had to go to Escanaba to make a living. She left her three children here with her with uh, her mother. She came back to visit them and she cried all the time she was here and Hugh said, I will marry you then Mary. So they ended up getting married and they had six children of their own. My mother was the youngest of them and her name was Mabel. She was born Mabel Conahan, she was born in 1893. She married Michael Cull in 1914. They had six children, of which I am the baby. They had Betty, Jack, Ray, Larry, and Sally, who was still alive and myself, uh, I was born in 1938. We had a home where I was born in, in the home next to the museum on Beaver Island, uh, born and raised, went to school here. Uh, I went to, uh, after school, I went to Chicago for 40 years got married, and I had one daughter by the name of Janet, 
who now lives in Minnesota. And after I retired, I said, I'm coming back to Beaver Island. So I, I have a home here on the property, which was bought by my grandparents in 1874, so uh, that. So now I'm ready for all the questions that I missed from these two young ladies. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, so we could go back a little bit um, to your great grandparents and your grandparents who came directly from Ireland to Beaver Island. Right, um, all all four of them. My my great grandparents. And my grandmother and my grandfather on the Cull side and on the Cunahan side, both of them came from Aaron Moore uh, in Ireland, which a lot of a lot of the families on Beaver Island came from Aaron Moore. And one of the reasons they say that they came there was a lot of work being done at that time. They all left Ireland because of the potato famine at that time. They were building two lighthouses here. There was a lot of fishing. There was some lumbering going on. So there was work here when, when they got here from Ireland. The one other story, they, they came to Toronto they ended up in Toronto. The ship that they came over on is called a coffin ship. A lot of the islanders came here at that time. The ship sank on the way back to England to re retrieve another bunch of Irishmen to, to, to this country. Um, do you know um, what the biggest changes were for them coming from Ireland to Beaver Island? Any were there any challenges? Well, the only you know the changes when they moved in the Mormon house, they say the Irish drove them off, but uh, they wanted to leave Beaver Island as much as the Irish wanted to take over. Some of the stories go that it, re it reminded them a lot of home in, in Ireland. Some of the, and the island, uh, the ones that came from Aaron Moore, this reminded them a lot of, of their, their home over there. The, uh, uh, that whole generation, there was a lot came and they spent three or four years and then they left. There's people come back to fifth generation now looking for genealogy out of out of them uh, and out of the out of the eleven in my dad's family, he was the only one that that stayed on Beaver Island. They they spread out all over, and all my other aunts and uncles on the on the other side after my grandmother remarried, they all left the island. A lot of them have come back to the great grandchildren now or come back they own homes here back in Beaver Island. So uh, I guess we all come back to some of our roots. Um, I was wondering if you knew anything about um, whether or not the Mormon family that um, left the house that your family um, occupied, did they leave anything behind, do you know of? Or? They said that there was clothes hanging on the on the hooks and there was there was fresh bread wow. <laughs> in the bread box you know they they were right here after after he got he got shot they they say this goes against some of the books that have been written they say there was 2700 mormons here but king strang took the census himself so I think he added a zero to what what he had. There may have been 270, and he said there's 2,700. They built the temple. They said would hold 2,600 people. So they said, well, there must have been 2,600 here. But my dad was born in 1885. He can so that was only about 40 years or so after King Strang that he can remember. 
He said there was never enough land and never enough housing for 2,700 people. So uh, this is where where I get my belief of of how it goes. The people say, well, he took the census. Well, he took the census. He was a lion conniving. We know that. But he was a great orator. He consoled a drowned man of rock. He, he convinced them to leave southern Illinois to go to Wisconsin and then come to Beaver Island. He promised them the land of milk and honey. They found some milk, but never too much honey, I don't believe. Very interesting. Um, did you uh, know your grandparents very well? No. Um, I uh, I have five grand grandfathers, two grandmothers, and never never knew uh, any of them. The last one died in 1929, nine years before I was born. So okay. uh, my my older my older siblings uh, knew them. You know, they lived, my my grandma Cunahan lived with, uh, with my mother for the last few years of her life up till then in the, in the late 1920s. Did you ever hear any stories of what their lives had been like? Um, sort of typical day or anything like that? No, it was, you know, uh, the one thing that, that I will say is my aunts and uncles used to come and I never wanted to listen to all them old stories. <laughs> now, now I would really love to, to, to know all them stories, but uh, uh, my sister and I talked about, about uh, you know, all the time now that something will come up about history and, and we said, well, we, sh we should have listened to, uh, to it, but we, <laughs> we, we never did, so. So your, but your grandparents when they came here they were, some of them are farmers, right? And then some of them are fishermen. Or yeah. Well, uh, my my dad ended up being a being a fisherman. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you that, and you can you can take both of these and, and read it because they're that's my brother wrote that uh, about my about my dad, uh, he, he went to fourth grade. Now, that's that's equivalent, probably then maybe the eighth grade. I, I don't know the, the education of, of the 1800s, but now we're talking to college students that's gonna be master, gonna go for her master, I could just tell by her smiling. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a it's a great difference. Right. And yours truly, he he graduated school here. No less than fourth in my class. Oh, uh, excellent. <laughs> there was four four of us graduated. There was seventy six kids K twelve. This year there was sixty one kids K twelve. Wow. And four graduated. So it hasn't really changed in oh. fifty five years. <laughs> Interesting. So could you talk about your parents a little bit, what they did for a living? Your dad was a fisherman. But, um. My dad was a commercial fisherman to the Lamprey Hills, put us out of business in the early 1950s. We had two fish boats at that time. The St. Lawrence Seaway opened up, and as great as it was for the country, it kind of ruined the Great Lakes. Uh, we're, we're still being infested with, uh, with the different uh, stuff that that comes from the ocean in our in our lakes, the zebra mussels, the gobies, the uh, stuff that grows on the beach now, different different varieties of stuff. Uh, one of our problems is the uh, the sun penetrates down through because they got the lake so clean that the bottom rots and it washes ashore and it stinks the, the whole place up and uh, there's really nothing we can can do about that. My dad ended up going sailing on the Great Lakes to get uh, Social Security, enough years of Social Security 
when he was 68 years old and I was still in high school because he was 54 when I was born and my mother was 45, so I always say I kept him young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, did Where's your question? I'll go first. Um, um, did um, your father, could you describe the relationship between like the fishermen here on the island and the farmers? Like, do you know what it was like? Your there was time. there was a great uh, relationship between them. A lot of them were were relatives, whether they be brothers or or the the women from the fishermen married farmers or the farmers' girls married the fishermen. So so there was a lot of a lot of camaraderie. Uh, they uh, would give fish to to the farmers or the farmers would give them you know they they survived when when it, my mother always said it was before my time they they never knew that there was a real depression here on Beaver Island because they had their own gardens we were fishermen and they farmed this they had they had their own we had cows pigs chickens and we had all the all the vegetables out of that they used to can so she always said that we never knew that the, the depression in the depression years a lot of the ones that had moved away had come back and lived with with their brothers and sisters here i had i had a man on one side a, and man on the other side of my family, one on the Cunons and one on the Culls that come back for a couple of years and some of their kids went to went to school here because it was really rough in the, on the mainland and, and we had so uh, like I said the, they never knew that there was uh, depression here com comparing to what it was in the, in the city. sort of goes along with that. Um, I was wondering, in light of the booming fishing industry you know, in the mid to late 19th century and then into the 20th century, um, were there any ever uh, class divisions that developed like between the fishermen and the other occupations or was it no, not a No, not really. Uh They'd fight among themselves, but when they when when push come to shove, they, they'd all they'd all stick together, and you know they 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 made a made a go of it because the lumbermen were here, uh, and two of my two of my uh, my uncles came through the through the lumber and industry. They came here, and then they married the two island girls, two of my aunts. Uh, at that time. That's why I can talk about 1900 and 1910 because I was I was so much much uh, younger than you know like I said my dad was 54 and my mother 45 and my aunts and uncles had kids uh, grandchildren older than, than I was. So um, You mentioned the lumber company. Do you know if the workers who came over, how they interacted with the the people here on the island, did they just assimilate or what? As far as far as I know, I have never heard of a of a lot of trouble in there. Uh, they, uh, like I said, they they married a lot of a lot of island girls at at that time. Uh, and I guess they were they were good for the island. In in our uh, beacon, our monthly paper, uh, they put in what happened a hundred years ago, and I believe it was this spring or last spring. There was a fire down at the south end of the island, a forest fire, and it says all the 
Beaver Island Lumber Company was down down fighting the fires. So, you know, they 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 were here like everybody else trying to trying to make a living. Now the uh, we had the the train that ran here at that time with the Beaver Island Lumber Company and up at Protar's house there was a train accident and the engineer got got killed that was in 1908 and that's the last time the train ran here on Beaver Island was in 1908 and they uh, uh, five years ago a lady asked are we going by there? And I said, yes, we are. She said, that was my grandfather. So that was, that was really, uh, really uh, something. Uh, and they uh, uh, tore the rail up in 1914, and they used the steel for World War I. Yeah, we're, we're, sorry, we're we're 1938. And then, um, and you were born in the house next to the print shop. Right? Yes. So, um. A little, a little story. My one brother was born. 73 years later, he died five feet from, from where he was born, in, in the house down next to the museum. Uh, um, so, what was life like for you growing up here on the island? Life was a lot different than it is than it is now. Uh, the one thing we did learn was to communicate. We weren't sitting working our thumbs on uh, on toys. Now we we all learned to dance. We were all all pretty good uh, dancers, and like I said, we learned to communicate because there was few enough people that. All the weddings, all the parties, most of the most of the you'd take the whole family and and we we associated with with adults a lot. We all learned to play cards. We were we were all considered good card players because you you had to fill in when the when they needed an extra player. So you had to play with the adults. You had to you had to learn. You had to think like like an adult. And it, it was, you know, we we knew no we knew no different. We and at that time the the U.S. when I was growing up in the in the 40s and 50s was just just booming after the Second World War. That was that was when the when the boom age came to to uh, to the United States mm -hmm. at that time. So and it it was different, but. We made our own entertainment. We we ice skated on the harbor down there. I could put my ice skates on in the house, walk across, ice skate for the for the evening. That we had our own fish shanties out there. We could fish perch in the harbor. So we had a lot of different stuff that they didn't have in the in the mainland. But we uh, we we maybe missed something, but I I don't know. Uh, I can't think of too much that, mm. that that we missed. So you had, you were one of six? Huh? You had five other siblings? or? Yeah, five. Okay. okay. Yeah, I had two sisters and three brothers older than me. Okay. I was, was the that, baby of the family, yeah, spoiled. Like? <laughs> <laughs> living in your house, what was it like living with all those siblings? That was pretty normal to have that many, right? My older sister was gone when I was oh, okay. when I was born, and and my uh, my next brother was uh, married when I was five years five years old. So it uh, uh, actually there was four of us when I was growing up, and and then when I was a teenager they they started moving away because the fishing industry was gone my my two next brothers and then my sister graduated and i was home alone you know for the last few years for the last six years with my mother and dad they would come home on vacation but they all moved 
to different places to live. Right. Um, and did you mostly interact with people in town since you lived you know, in town by the print shop, or were you able to go out in the country a lot and play with kids? Or well, the, the first up up till high school, and then high school we all went together, and then 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 we we all hung around together then uh, with everybody on the island. Okay. Um, could you describe your experiences at school? Where'd you go? Did everyone go to the... When, when I started, there was, there was two schools here. Sunnyside School, which is up by what we call the Four Corners, where the gas station sits now, and the laundromat is right right behind the laundromat. That was one through eighth grade. Downtown at the main school, we had one through 12th grade. We had no, no kindergarten at that time. And we, we were taught in a public school by Catholic nuns. Can you imagine what the ACLU would do in a day like this today? Mm -hmm. They would be here in mass form. <laughs> and in school, school, if we had first through fourth grade and fifth through eighth, if you were in the fourth grade and you you didn't understand what was going on. You weren't paying attention because you heard it for four years before this. Or if you started the fifth grade and by the eighth grade you better know something because you, you heard it for, that's the fourth year you were hearing all that stuff. And, uh, the education was like a one-on-one. -on -one and uh, You didn't come home until tell mother or dad, well, the, the nun was picking on me because you got picked on again then. <laughs> and that's the way it is now. They, you know, they got enough teachers. Uh, it's like one-on-one. -on -one for... So the education, I believe, is is equal to, to probably anywhere. In the... um, do you remember who were some of the other kids who were in your, in your classes who you hung around with? I graduated with Rosemary McDonough. She was valedictorian in my class. Hubert McCauley, uh, Thelma Smith, and myself. We graduated uh, 1956. And uh, at that time, there was 19 of us in high school. The the ninth grade had had the big class. They had nine in their in their class, so, so yeah, and you girls probably went to a school with 300 or 400 or 500 kids, so, so it, it is a little, it is a little bit different. Uh, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages, but we, we had uh, always had our high school prom, uh, and we had uh, a lot of different. We we very seldom missed on, on anything that that went on. I don't believe. And how did the um, the prom work? Did the whole high the school whole high school the whole high school <laughs> went to make make uh, enough to uh, that and and a lot of the parents, a lot of the you know all the teachers, the parents, and, and we we could invite different people, you know to. To make up, you know, so there'd there'd be uh, there'd be plenty there. And we, with the year I graduated, I had the superintendent come. Uh, we had from Petoskey, he was the superintendent of all the schools. He come over and give us the diploma. And, uh, a little bit different than we used to. We graduated in church, which which is would be a complete no no again today. So. You know, there was a lot of different, a little bit different uh, things at that time that that took place uh, that that don't couldn't happen today because they would go completely crazy on that. Um, when either your 
grandparents or parents or even yourself were growing up, would you say that the church was sort of the center of the community life? or? Um, yeah, probably. Uh, but the church was out of town, so... But anything that that took place took place in the hall at that time. All the dances, all the, you know, the meetings, whatever, whatever took place, the the hall would have been uh, been there. Uh, and they had uh, at that time uh, they had a bowling alley here. They had the Hibernia. They they met upstairs where I was born at there was a, a hall up there in the Hibernia I used to meet meet up there uh, and they had a band and there was a lot of different stuff that went on at, at that at that time than there is now do you remember any of the um, dances or the house parties do you remember any stories from them yeah, the, uh, all the all the dances, uh, you know, uh, and the house parties. Uh, there was two or three houses that always had the had a lot of the house parties, uh, and they had the fiddler and the, the guy to play the guitar and the piano, and they were the entertainment for for all the dances. We all learned to square dance at that time, and a lot of people don't even know square dance. What's that? But that was one of our, one of our things. One of the interesting places growing up was the the villa, which is over at uh, uh, over at. The Coast Guard Station. He had a hot dog stand. The gentleman just passed away uh, about three weeks ago. His name was Carl Felix. He came from Chicago, and he and he built he built a, a small place so we could have a a place to dance. And he bought a jukebox. So we put our quarter in. At that time it was six songs for a dollar. We'd get six dances and go. <laughs> Go for another hour, and we come back and put another quarter in them, or six dances, and it was it was a nice place, and it was a quite a quite a deal for him to to build that for he built that for us kids at that time. So. And as you were either during the school year or in the summer, would you have to do would you have to work too? We we all we all worked. At that time, uh, during all during high school, especially, uh, you would work because at that time there there was no money. There was there was hardly anything here in the in the early fifties because uh, the fishing industry went. Uh, so we did we did what uh, what we could. I worked in the in the garage, which is. Uh, pumping gas and changing tires and that all through high school and everybody else I did a little a little perch fishing trying to make a few extra dollars at the, at that time anything to to, uh, to make it so it, you know the and there wasn't tourism there's more people coming one weekend now than it would be for the whole summer at that time. <laughs> Would your siblings do the same kind of work, or would they do? One one of my brothers ended up being captain on the Great Lakes on the thousand foot steamboat. My other one ended up. Uh, two of them ended up retiring from trucking outfits in Chicago. Uh, I ended up retiring from cargo grain in Chicago. I was a house inspector for them. Could you talk about um, more things you would do in the winter time for fun? 
Then the sliding downhill was was probably the big. And you know, we we had different hills. We could light fires and ice skating was was a big thing. And we always had a fire out in the ice. You know, a warm and we never had a warm and shed. We we'd have a big a big fire that that we would that you could skate up to. And, uh, there might be 30 or 40 of the adults and everybody would be out there for for the skating. So uh, that was primary. And and the dances or whatever, uh, it was always a place that didn't take too much to start a party. And then when the party would go, we, we would all get our chance to uh, to go. And how would you get around in the wintertime, transportation-wise? You're two feet. Two feet. Mm -hmm. Two feet. Yeah. The, uh, and there was there was a few cars, you know. Uh, going to church, there was a mile and something. And most cars were full because a lot of people didn't have a car. So they, they would pick other people up and... We always wanted to walk. There'd be 15 or 20 of us walking. Wow. Yeah, that was that was always a big yeah. We set out, you know, the farmers would bring, would someone would bring their horses to uh, to church at that time for for that because they had no cars. So. Um, do you remember? Um, who any of the sort of old timers were when you were growing up? Any of the characters on the, the characters? <laughs> we <laughs> we had a cast of characters from Beaver Island. <laughs> uh, some of them, some of them, uh, I couldn't even tell you their stories. But we had we had one gentleman by the name of Chapman here. His uh, ancestor was he was from Johnny Appleseed's ancestors, uh, and he uh, his boy and I grew up. He was a year year behind me at school, but he he was one of the characters. He, he always said Johnny Appleseed had a bit crazy walking around with a pocket full of seeds planting apple trees, <laughs> and there was there was there was other ones in the. Uh, some of them came that were loggers, uh, and they lived out out in the, the country. And uh, some of them, the fishermen, and some of the old time that was here, born and raised in the island, were the uh, cast of characters uh, in their own rights, whatever, whatever may be. Uh, and the entertainment was, you know, storytelling. There was some great storytellers there. You know, uh, and like I said, dancing. Everybody, most most people were were all good dancers. I can remember some of the old Irish doing it, doing the Irish dances and, and that. So, um, other than the Irish dances, were there any other um, Irish traditions that came over with your great grandparents? Not, not that, that we ever had, and and I don't know of any. I, I think they they wanted to leave some of uh, their memories back there because it was tough times in Ireland when when they came. There was another family came here that ran the sawmill by the name of Wojan. They're still around them around. We all learned to polka because they were of Polish descent. Oh. And uh, that's one of the one of the uh, things that, that we learned from from that family. What percent of the population was Irish while you were growing up? What was the demographic? When I left here in fifty six it was around two hundred, maybe two twenty five. Now it's five hundred, five fifty year round. We have a lot of retirees here, and and that that come that want to retire, but it's a lot different than it was uh, 
50 years ago when there were, when, now, now I got all the modern conveniences in the world from television to internet to, to whatever, plug something in and that. The electric light plant set, and then they'd get overloaded, and then they'd go out right at supper time because it was always loaded. Now we get our electricity from from the mainland, 22 miles underneath the water, and, and we very seldom uh, lose our electricity here like we did uh, in them days. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything about the island that has changed or disappeared since you were growing up that you wish was still around, or anything about the way of life? The one, the one thing that that it was gone when right after King Strang was shot was the temple, I always thought, and that's right down on the corner from the brothers there. I always thought that, that how nice that would have been if, but that was the first thing they burned after they shot the king, they said, was was burned a temple. Well, that that would have been nice to, uh, to show everybody. I tell everybody, a lot of people come here now they want to sink the boat and shoot the plane out of the sky. They want to be last. They say, oh, we found paradise. We don't want nobody else here. I said, well, you should have been here 50 years ago when, when there was nothing here. I said, I said, without, without tourism, we die here. So, so you can forget about heaven, just, just you be, being here as, as this is your paradise. So. And then the changes, I some people mind them, but I I, I believe that the, they had to change and, and they've changed for the better. Great. Um, in the car, you mentioned um, your interaction with the brothers' place. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, the brothers came here every summer when when I was growing up, and every evening. They would, they would walk to the point. And they'd be probably 40 of them or 50 of them. There was always a great, a great group. We had a fish boat, and we used to take them to High Island uh, every once. That was one of their field trips, and uh, they were they were always great athletes and play ball, and then they. Uh, they played the big kitten ball from from Chicago, the big 16 inch. We used to play the play the the 12 inch. And being young, I used to be out by the brothers because I I knew we knew where the cookhouse was. We knew all the cooks, and we always made the mornings for when the rolls and the cookies and the donuts come out, so we could always get get free samples from out there. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, it was donated by by the land by a gentleman by the name of uh, Maloney. He lived in Chicago, and I guess he knew some of the brothers down there. And that was built in the 1900s, and they had our 1920s, I believe. And they had they had all the good island cooks out there, so the, all the Christian brothers ate pretty good on the, while they were here. So what have been some of your fondest memories of growing up on the island? Most most of the the memories was good. I I support Beaver Island and in most everything that they do. A lot of people say they got bad memories cuz we were poor and I said well, everybody was poor so it made no made no difference uh, and like I said, we we never went there was never anybody in Beaver Island went to bed hungry if it was it was your own fault because there was always food and you know so the people that say well there was this was wrong and that was wrong I I I don't even listen to them because I, I think I I loved every minute of it or I wouldn't have come back when I retired to uh, to do it. Did 
you want to hold on. So when we left off, um, you were telling us about your fond memories of Beaver yeah. Island, and now I sort of wanted to switch gears a little bit and have you tell us about the fishing industry on Beaver Island when the it was in its heyday, when your dad was a fisherman. The fishing, fishing industry on Beaver Island in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was more fish shipped out of Beaver Island than any other port on the Great Lakes. We had 17 different fish boats out of here at that time. We had five fish buyers, one of them still in business today, Booth Fishery. If you go in the store, you can find frozen cod and different stuff from that Booth Fishery uh, sell. And over the years, uh, there was great fishing till in the 40s, the Lamprey Eels came in and they wrecked the, the fishing industry. We would set nets and they believed that the dead fish may have been eight or ten feet deep in the, because the nets stunk so bad when they, they came ashore. So there were millions and millions of pounds of fish that the lamprey yields. Then they, they uh, came back and they could use trap nets and, and then they closed that down completely and now the American Indian is the only one that can legally commercially fish the waters around Beaver Island due to the Treaty of 1855 which also gives them the right to own their, the casinos and makes them a sovereign nation uh, in the land that they have. We have two gentlemen fishing here now on Beaver Island. Uh, and they, one, I think they belong to one, the Grand Travers uh, band, and the other one belongs to uh, one of the bands in the north, uh, in the Upper Peninsula. But the, the fishing industry come back a little bit, and they planted the salmon in here for the commercial industry. But like I said earlier in the interview, the canal opened up the St. Lawrence Seaway as good as it was. It kind of destroyed our Great Lakes. And now we got a problem coming through Illinois down there with the Asian carp. They said is, is now going to be our next destroyer of, of the Great Lakes. So, so and that was all man-made. They they brought them in to, to do one thing, and then the, they got flooded over, and they got loose, and now they're, and I guess they're pretty bad. They jump right in the boat with you, so. <laughs> so you girls watch when you go fishing that they don't jump in the boat. Okay? Yeah. Um, do you have any stories that your dad told you about fishing on the boat? Charles? When he was... Young, right after he got married, they went, they used to go to the Foxes, which is south of, south of Beaver Island, and fish in the fall. And he had one of the first gasoline engines on his small boat, and he came in, the, he was overdue, and he came in towing two other schooners that were sailboats and the gentleman ran up and told my mother, here comes Columbus, the Nina, the Pinto, and the Santa Maria. So that, that was always always my dad. And, and when they'd get a big lift, they'd always tie the broom to the to the smokestack. It meant that that they 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 got a, overloaded with fish, they made a clean sweep. All the fish boats out of here that had Collenberg engine in it, every Collenberg had a different sound of its own. You didn't have to turn around. You could tell they go ping, 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 ping. They, they had the different sounds so that uh, you could tell which boat was coming. Uh, and they all had their, more or less, their own fishing areas that they, they used to fish in, so they never... They were cutting one another's throat uh, in going in where, where they uh, 
the other gentlemen were fishing out of. Great. Do you have any more questions? Really? Uh, I got one more, one more story. Okay, go ahead. The, the Merrill, which was the tanker Boyd, ran aground up off north west of Beaver Island, and it had aviation gas on it, and they were. They were uh, retrieving it. There's pictures where they went out on ice and, and with old cars and they'd pump it in. Well, the Merrill had run the route between here and Charlevoix and they were using it. They said this was going to be their last, their last run. There was five of them on there. There was two. Uh, Coles, Everett and Raymond, there was a Hill, another gentleman, and a, one by the name of Bruce McDonough. His first name was Roland, and that's who I'm named after. That The accident happened in 1937. I was born in 30, 38, and that's, that's where my, my name comes from. So what did we miss? I think you covered everything. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you very much for thank you. letting us interview you. Thank you.